Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to the Office of the Chief Scientist Science Seminar Series. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Mark Edwards, Senior Science Advisor with the OCS and your host for today. On behalf of the entire OCS team, welcome to our Science Seminar Series and to today's seminar. First, as you may have noticed from the notification at the top of the window, uh, we are recording today's seminar. If you'd like to ask a question or have comments, you are welcome to put them in the chat at any time. The chat won't be recorded on the videos, so you can submit your questions there. Recordings from previous seminars are now available on the Alberta Environment and Protected Areas YouTube page, uh, and new recordings will be posted there in the near future. I'm happy to, to give the land acknowledgement today. I respectfully acknowledge that our OCS offices are located on the traditional lands and gathering places for Treaty 6 and 7, Region 3 and 4 of the Métis Nations of Alberta. These lands are home to diverse Indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Soto, Anishinaabe, Métis, and Inuit peoples, and many other whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant communities today. In keeping with the tradition of gathering, these science seminars provide an opportunity for us to get together, to exchange knowledge on interesting science happening across Alberta in an open learning and sharing environment. The hope is that through our dialogue today, we are all able to improve our awareness and understanding and put this knowledge into practice to support evidence-informed decision-making wherever that occurs. Now, to help maintain our call quality today, your video and audio have been disabled, and we encourage you to enter any questions or comments you have at any time during or after the presentation via the Teams chat function. I will read the questions and comments in the order that they were received. Today, we welcome Jody Krakowski. Jody has been Vice President of the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation of Canada since 2015. She is an independent consultant who has been involved with five needle pines since the late 1990s. As co-chair of the Provincial White Bark and Limber Pine Recovery Team, she collaborates to implement provincial recovery plans throughout Alberta. In her prior role as a provincial gene conservation specialist for Alberta, she worked on gene conservation of native forest species and applied forest genetic products, uh, projects and policy. She has spent most of her career gallivanting around the forests of beautiful British Columbia as a consultant, terrestrial ecologist, forester, and research scientist with UBC and the BC Forest Service. Over to you, Jody. But yeah, thank you everybody for coming out. I appreciate you spending the time to, to come have, watch this webinar with me. Um, so I just wanted to provide a little short introduction. The White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation of Canada is a not-for-profit that is registered in Alberta and BC, and we're dedicated to the conservation, stewardship, and education of endangered white bark and liver pine ecosystems. I'm presenting this webinar, but every single step of the way, every slide, there's been lots of partners that are essential to make all these things happen. So, yeah. Um, I'll just uh, share a brief outline with you, and hopefully at some point you'll see it too. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna talk about the status of the species in Alberta and nationally, the values that they provide, the ecology and the ecology of how these species grow and interact is really essential to um, informing how we deal with the recovery, the threats these species face, the recovery plans, the restoration actions, which of course is the part everyone gets excited about, <laughs> and what we're doing in the future. So, all right. So I'll just begin with the status of white bark pine. So up in the top left is a close-up of some cones. They're about the size of an egg, pretty big, good for pine cone fights. Um, these species are listed as endangered in Alberta since 2008 under the Provincial Wildlife Act. The associated regulation under the Act lacks any protection or penalties for killing these endangered plants or their habitat. So for this, for the purposes of information for the most part, unlike wildlife that are animals, <laughs> they don't specifically have protection if they're plants in the province. Federally, these species are listed, on, or these species were recommended in 2010 by the Committee on the, the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada as endangered. Then in 2012, 
the federal minister added them to Schedule One for the Species at Risk Act, so they're actually listed as endangered species. Now, being added to Schedule One means that it triggers the development of a federal recovery strategy. So in 2015, there was a draft, then it was called proposed, and uh, apparently there's a new one underway called proposed amended, but has never been finalized. That means that the federal Species at Risk Act listing means it's protected on federal land and parks. So basically it's already in a provincial park, so it's protected. Um, critical habitat is habitat that is designated in an approved recovery, a federal recovery strategy. And that is the habitat necessary for species survival recovery. It was designed with animals in mind because plants don't actually move, so they kind of need the same habitat for all parts of their life. But because there is no approved federal recovery strategy, there's no designated critical habitat at this time for white pine. So, limber pine, um, and up in the top left, there's a close up of some cones. On the left, uh, the orange or the brown cone is an open cone from the year before. Above it is a very small little developing cone that is going to be a real cone next year. And on the right is a greenish larger cone. And those are the cones we're interested in collecting seeds from. So um, in 2008, the same as limber pine, Alberta was designated, or Alberta designated these as endangered under the Provincial Wildlife Act. Same as white bark pine, there's no legal protection associated with this designation provincially. In 2014, Kosiwik recommended these species as being federally endangered. Um, and even though it's pretty much the end of 2022, they've still never been added to the Provincial Species at Risk Act schedule. So they have no status federally. Therefore, there's also no recovery plan and there's no critical habitat identified. That means that they're protected just by virtue of being in a national park or a provincial park. So if they're living in a protected area where it's you know, prohibited to damage or destroy things in that park, then they're protected. So these species provide some unique values that other species don't provide. And it's important for us to consider that the status of these species as endangered means that they're at risk of becoming extirpated. And um, these values might not be replaced by any other species. The most important role that white bark and limber pine play is their huge provenance, prominence in providing wildlife habitat and food. The seeds of these species are enormous compared to all other conifers of comparable size, and they're extremely high in fat and protein. So there's been documented about 100 different wildlife species that rely on these, well, that use these species or the seeds for food. In Alberta, they're a little bit more opportunistic, but for sure that little bird on the left-hand side is called a Clark's nutcracker. It's in the, the J family and it is, has a really important relationship with both white bark pine and limber pine. And being a biologist, I had to include a photo of some poo. So um, there's some grizzly droppings in the top side and that entire uh, grizzly sign is made entirely of white bark pine chewed up um, seed, uh, seed coats. So bears love these seeds. They will do pretty much anything to get the cones. They chew them all up and they don't really leave anything behind. Um, yeah. Another important value is for headwater streams. So high, these are high elevation species. They grow in the mountains. Their uh, trunks and, and <clears throat> branches provide a lot of important shade. And so this shading effect can prolong the snow melt for about three weeks. And this provides an important source of prolonged and cool water stream flow for a lot of mountain streams. And this is especially important in Alberta for species that are in trouble like bull trout and west slope cutthroat trout. The roots can be pretty long and um, stretch a long way. And because they grow in um, scree slopes and friable soils, things like that, the roots can anchor in fri friable soils and these steep slopes that, that other trees can't often do. 
They also are what's called tree line anchors. Because whitebark pine and often limber pine grow at the upper tree line, they, their presence can stimulate the formation of tree line plant communities. And they do it in such a way that other species don't typically um, have the same initiation processes. These unique ecological functions mean that both whitebark and limber pine are known as keystone or umbrella species ecologically. There are no other species that fulfill all these roles and without them, the ecosystems that they um, inhabit and the functions that they can provide would be quite different. Also, many First Nations use different parts of these plants for different ceremonial and cultural purposes. And the unique trees were often used as important landmarks in meeting places and still are today. And as well, for any of you guys that hang out in white bark and limber pine territory, um, hikers, skiers, ranchers, and also locals who live in these places are really attached to these picturesque and beautiful trees. And some of you guys might um, recognize the Burmese tree, which is now a, a skeleton of a limber pine tree that marks the historic Crow's Nest Pass. And it's a historic resource. Uh, there's a pull out there and thousands and thousands of people take photos of this tree and um, yeah. It's, it's just considered an important cultural value for Alberta. So for the ecology of these species, um, I wanna emphasize that a real take home message is they grow super slowly. <laughs> um, limber pine takes about 50 years to reach maturity and make its own seeds. And white bark pine takes about 80 years and they take another couple of decades to begin producing abundant cones. So basically consider that these trees take a, like a hundred years to replace themselves. They can live a long time, a thousand years or more under the right conditions, which is pretty awesome. Um, they're shade intolerant. So often these species are pioneers after disturbance, they colonize open sites, or they can also be veterans and long lived, long -lived species after um, in sparse sites where other trees can't compete. So like rocky ridges, really dry spots, super steep slopes, that's often where you'll find these trees. They uh, tend to grow at the tree line, white bark and limber pine at the upper tree line, and limber pine also at the lower tree line, integrating with grasslands. They form irregular cone crops. So unlike most tree species, they don't make cones and seeds every year. Just sort of randomly every three to five years when the conditions are right, and the cones take two years to grow. So you'll see the little conelets and then over the winter they will develop if the weather is right and they don't freeze. And if the conditions are right when they're pollinating and if the timing and weather are just right for the pollen to actually synchronize and fertilize the immature ovules, then you will get cones. But generally in between, there's no cones and that might happen, for, like I said, for three to five years and then there's what's happening, what, what we call a mast year, where all of the trees in a certain region or even a very extensive area will make tons of cones, which is pretty good for us because the two-year cone cycle means we can survey the year before, we can plan to try and secure funding and um, logistics and try and collect all the cones we can in those very rare years when we can get them. Another important thing is that these species are bird dispersed. So this bird is the Clark's nutcracker and you will hear them squawking away like this if you're in a white bark and limber pine stand. I hope you guys could hear that. Anyway, um, so uh, white bark pine is entirely reliant on the Clark's nutcracker to reproduce. The tree cannot reproduce without this bird planting the seeds. The cones have over thousands and thousands of generations. They've lost the tissue that flexes open the cone scales so the seeds don't fall out. They rely on the birds to fly overhead, see the bright purple cones, and then peck them apart. And it has a special um, pouch under its bill where the bird then um, collects all the seeds, stores them in this pouch so it looks like a big flying chipmunk, and then it caches the seeds in the ground 
to provide food over the winter and spring when there's not a lot of other food. Each bird has an incredible memory because this is pretty much all they do. <laughs> and they cache about 100,000 seeds a year in 30,000 different places. And they dig up about a third of those. And the rest of those is actually how the tree regenerates. And for limber pine, things are pretty similar, but it is a little bit different that the cones do open and a lot of the seeds do fall out and other wildlife species eat them. But without getting planted and buried in the ground, the seeds, because they have such high fat and protein, they'll decay and they'll go rancid and they can't germinate without a bird planting the seed. And the only bird that does this is the Clark's nutcracker. When the birds cache the seeds, they plant them in little groups. And that often you'll see the seedlings growing in these little clumps. Now we don't know if each stem is from a different seed or if, because they don't, they generally have a pretty bushy growth form. They could actually be from one stem that just branched out. And the only way we can tell that is genetic analysis. But we just need to keep these genetic patterns in mind. So these caching patterns and when a bird plants many, many seeds in a cache, it could you know, have different genetic individuals or it could just be one individual with many stems. So we have to consider that during our recovery work. Now, these species are threatened by a bunch of different threats. And the worst threat in Alberta and a lot of Canada is called white pine blister rust. And there's a photo of it on the right. Those orangey blisters is a tree infected with this disease that causes blister rust. I'm gonna talk more about this. A mountain pine beetle, and you'll see up in the top left, this is a close-up of tree bark and the little blobs are holes where female mountain pine beetles drilled in there and they were going to lay their eggs over the winter. And then the little hatchlings, the little larvae would eat the living tissue under the bark. And if enough mountain pine beetles attack a tree at once, it will kill the tree. Now tree obviously isn't crazy about this. So it tries to prevent insects from attacking it and those orangey or yellowy bits are sap and the tree tries to protect itself by pitching out beetle attack with sap. If enough, like about 100 beetles attack a tree at once, it'll probably die. Other threats are changes in fire regimes. So for example, human fire suppression. It increases competition to white bark and limber pine by other faster growing species. It also increases the frequency of severe and bigger fires as fuel builds up if there's a longer and longer period of fire exclusion in the landscape. And it decreases landscape heterogeneity. And you can definitely see when you look at projects like the Mountain Legacy Project, for example, old historic photos, there used to be a mosaic of different age classes and different species all over these mountain landscapes. And now you'll see very extensive landscapes composed of similar species and similar age classes. And climate change, if interacts, well, these threats interact with each other and climate change causes them to either be increased or to have more dramatic interactions. So climate with increased warming, there's fewer and fewer mountain pine beetles that die over the winter. So their populations build up and they kill more trees. Climate change increases summer drought, which stresses trees out which makes them more vulnerability, more vulnerable to beetle attack and to blister rust. And also summer drought increases fire frequency. So of course, humans are also a threat, especially to limber pine. So a little bit about white bark pine or white pine blister rust. This disease is introduced first to North America from Eurasia where it's native around 1908. It was introduced in a bunch of infected seedlings to the port of Vancouver and has been reintroduced in the East and West Coast many, many times. We cannot get rid of it. Almost every single tree that gets infected, and that is all five needle pine trees, they all die except for a few rare resistant trees. It infects the trees through the needles, grows down into the branches, into the stem, and everything above that dies. So you'll see in the bottom photo, there are a lot of mature trees with dead tops they have stopped making cones. So their unique ecological functions are being impaired. They're not providing wildlife food. They can't reproduce themselves because of blister rust, because they, the crown has died and those trees are gonna pretty much all shortly be dead, unfortunately. 
Now, the fungus for nerd people, which I know the office of the chief scientist probably has a couple. Um, if you're interested in pathology, this disease has a super interesting life cycle with five different spore stages. And the spore stage that you will see infecting white bark pine trees and limber pine trees cannot infect another tree. It requires another host plant to complete the rest of its life cycle so it can get infect a tree again. And the one in the photo here is a currant or gooseberry bush. And so you'll see it is heavily infected with blister rust. And it is, there's actually quite a few species that can be alternate hosts of this, this fungus. And that explains why it's so prevalent and widespread. Um, to evaluate the effects and trends of blister rust, we monitor a series of permanent monitoring plots every five years. This gives us important baseline information. We do other health assessments because the permanent plots are super expensive and time consuming. So we also do um, short-term plots. And this gives us key information on the rate of decline and um, patterns showing greater or lesser severity and, and um, rates of decline. And then this helps us prioritize what we're gonna do in what areas for recovery actions. And then I'll just uh, briefly, this paper was published a few years ago now, looking at prior monitoring data. So every five years we do this. This is just for white bark pine. And uh, this is a, like based on a logistic model for the Rocky Mountains and Columbia's only. And so this map shows you the predicted probability of infection based on the model for mature trees. And you can see that red area, trees in the crown of the continent, like Waterton and the Kootenays, have a probability of being infected almost 100%. And then the further north and the further east you go, the lower the probability of infection. And mortality trends are similar. Um, I just wanted to mention because it's a model, this is sort of a smooth surface and there is quite a lot of variability because the disease is caused by a fungus and there's a lot of smaller scale factors that influence um, the fungal infection rate. On average, this is pretty accurate. And then this is a map of the model showing regeneration. So when we do our monitoring plots, we also look at, is the stand replacing itself? And you can see that regeneration is pretty good in the northern part of the range and in the western part of the range. And in the south and towards the east, generally where it's drier, it is, this, these species are not replacing themselves. Mortality is much higher than regeneration. And over time, over these three three um, visits, and we are just working on the next analysis now, and hopefully it'll be published before the our next monitoring. <laughs> but first of all, uh, the, the Y, or excuse me, the Y axis is how much of the canopy is killed. And that reflects trees that can't produce cones anymore. So the more canopy kill, the less the stand can regenerate. So on the X axis is latitude, um, going on the left from the southernmost area, on the right to the north. And the first visit, you can see that um, trees across the latitude of white bark pine all had similar amounts, about 25% canopy kill. The next time, five years later, stands in the south had significantly greater mortality than in the north. And then five years after that, there was a huge bump and there's way more mortality in the south. And since then, we've collected more data again, and I can't say that that trend has improved. It might look in some areas like it's improved a little bit, but for the most part, the reason is because there's so many fewer trees living that can die, the rate of mortality is declining because these stands are not replacing themselves, not because the trees are dying less, it's because already so many trees have died. So this is an aerial shot from around the Flathead area. Um, this was a mixed stand with subalpine pine fir, um, spruce, and a lot of white bark pine. And if you can see all the gray skeletons, all of those were white bark pine that have died because of the stress. And I've circled the only two white bark pine mature trees that I can see in this whole mountainside that are alive. Um, and then this is from the castle. These are limber pine. And we see extensive areas like this where pretty much all the trees have died from blister rust. So 
the thing is these species are endangered not because they're rare, they're endangered because the rate of decline is so steep. All right, so mountain pine beetle is the next bad threat. Everyone involved in Alberta forest health knows that this is a top priority for forest health. And then for the federal part of the range on national parks, um, the federal government does forest insect and disease surveys and the provincial forest health team um, has a very active survey and control program. So what we do is we identify high risk areas, map the likelihood of spread using various models, and then we take mitigation actions. And these can be at different scales. So we can um, protect certain high value trees. And these are using chemicals that send signals to beetles telling them to stay away from this tree. You can also um, do control measures of the stand. And then you can influence landscape patterns, making areas more or less susceptible to mountain pine beetle. Fire is another one that we just talked about. So overall, the trend is that fires are getting more severe and larger in Western North America. Fires remove fine fuels, but they also create a lot of large fuels. Until recently, fire was seen as fairly beneficial to white bark pine, but new studies um, show that this is really not the case at all. Um, it's, it's quite variable. Um, and yeah, these photos show white bark pine stands that have all been uh, burnt very heavily. So uh, in Alberta, fire management is not available as a tool for white bark pine and limber pine restoration management at this time. This is from the business plan of the forest ministry, which I can't remember, sorry. I think there's a new name, <laughs> but anyway, this is still um, a key performance measure to basically put out every fire. So no matter how remote the area is, for the most part, full on fire suppression is a priority for this government because of other values on the landscape. Fire suppression changes ecosystems in a few different ways. So there's beneficial ways or effects on limber and white bark pines ecosystems. Fire remove, removes competition like we described other species. It promotes regeneration by opening up habitat and it reduces the blister rust hosts on the land. Negative effects are, well, these trees have really thin bark. It just kills them. So that's kind of negative. It also kills the seedlings and really severe fires can kill mycorrhizae that are important to the growth of these species. So um, human impacts also affect these species. Some of you guys might recall a few years ago hearing about uh, the Lake Louise ski hill. They got fined $2.1 million for killing 38 endangered white bark pine trees in Banff National Park. Also heli skis, so um, other facilities, uh, Whistler, the peak to peak gondola, pretty much put all their buildings right on a former white bark pine stand. <laughs> um, yeah, ski glading, where do you put your trails, exploration for mining and minerals, quarries, linear disturbance like power lines and pipelines, forestry, and in the right hand side, there are um, a whole bunch of cup blocks that are, were harvested at about 2000 meters in white bark pine areas. This is all, uh, like we said in Alberta, this is all permitted because of the, the status of plants under the Provincial Wildlife Act, whether they're endangered or not, does not afford them any protection. In limber pine habitat, grazing can also impede limber pine regeneration and cause trampling and kill seedlings. Vandalism and cutting down trees for firewood, we also see this from time to time. And I just wanted to remind you guys that every tree that is killed takes about a hundred years to replace. So one of the best practices that is important to consider that I think is used in the Alberta wetland policy is the mitigation hierarchy. First, before any other thing, we would like to ensure that impacts are avoided in the first place. The next best thing if impacts can't be avoided is to minimize impacts, then to mitigate the impacts then to compensate or offset them. So ideally, before causing an impact, we could try and look at all those other steps first. So because you're going to the office of the chief scientist, I'm going to talk about the recovery plan because science, scientists love plans. But um, yeah, I think Alberta's done a super great job at this. Um, since 2003, there's been an Alberta recovery team for white bark and limber pine. 
And this is because since the mid nineties, when researchers and field people started realizing the declines of these species, um, people started compiling, started studying them and setting up these monitoring plots and realizing, oh, this is, this is a lot bigger than my park or my spot or my hiking area. This is a big problem that we all need to address together. So Cindy Smith, retired ecologist from Watertonics National Park, um, helped pull a great team together of whom I know quite a few are on this call today. So yeah, and um, having Parks Canada involved was a really beneficial step because Waterton Lakes National Park and Glacier National Park were the first international peace park. So that created some international relationships and then also bringing different agencies together. So provincial, federal, and there was also some not-for-profits on that group. So that was really great. In 2009, recovery plans were developed for the province and then the government of Alberta led the recovery implementation and tracking of all the, the planned actions. Then in 2001, following various reorganization, the White Bark Pine Ecosystem Foundation of Canada started leading the implementation with a co-chair um, in the Alberta government and shout out to my awesome recovery chair or recovery team co-chair, Robin Gutzel, who I think is probably on this call too. And in 2022, finally, the updated recovery plan combined for both species has been published and it's online and it follows the conservation standards framework. Now this is an internationally recognized framework that um, <clears throat> a lot of conservation and funding organizations follow. It's very focused on science-based outcomes and goals um, and identifying and mitigating threats. And the nice thing about the conservation standards is it's quite flexible. It can apply to a lot of different situations and scales. And it also really helps you track between the goal you want to achieve and the logical steps of how you can achieve that goal. And all of these random side things kind of follow, fall to the wayside. So only the actions and priorities that are really going to achieve conservation goal outcomes are included in the plan. Now, a lot of um, our partner organizations are using the same approach in their recovery and restoration plans. So BC has a um, implementation plan for five needle pines now that is just about finalized. And the new federal recovery strategy is also gonna be using that. And then various transboundary and other um, agencies are also following this exact same procedure and all of our goals and plans are aligned. That's awesome. So I know this is the part that everyone gets more excited about. What are we actually doing? Well, lots. The first step though, is to find out where the species are. Because they're not commercially viable species, nobody was super interested in um, mapping them. <laughs> so the Alberta um, Baseline Forest Inventory, the AVI, did not have accurate records for these species because it's not merchantable. It grows in remote areas and a lot of the inventory is um, not super up to date. And we found actually comparing with other jurisdictions that um, theirs were more accurate than Alberta. <laughs> so instead, what we ended up doing was supporting um, with the available data that we had, a whole bunch of habitat suitability modeling and ground truthing to validate how accurate that model was. And it was pretty good. And it was based on presence absence. We also tried this for abundance, but that, that was um, the accuracy was too low to use. We're now collecting a big pile of new data and we're hoping to release updated versions of this information. Next, we use this, this information like we just talked about the genetics and um, seed dispersal. We incorporate this into a strategic plan. So not just, oh, what mountaintop can I reach with my truck? We actually need to think about restoration at the species level. And so we have to be a lot more strategic than then where is the closest microwave tower? Plus trees, I'm gonna talk uh, a little bit more about that in a moment. These trees are the core of our recovery program. Now, when we find a plus tree, and these trees are trees that we believe are disease resistant based on a whole bunch of criteria that we assess in the field. We need to collect those cones and we need to process the seeds and we need to store the seeds. 
you can't just go to the store or get your seed catalog and order white bark pine seeds or limber pine seeds. You have to get them yourself. And if you want your seedlings to live long enough to make their own seeds, which is the goal of recovery, they have to be from trees that are disease resistant. So you have to be able to identify these plus trees and collect their seeds in the random years when they're actually making cones. The next thing we do is we have to test those trees for disease resistance. So because they appear resistant in the field, we still have to verify and validate that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then we do the restoration other stuff. <laughs> so we protect those plus trees from whatever bad things might happen to them. Um, and we plant seedlings and we thin competition and we do other stuff. We've also developed species specific seed zones based on the genetics, biology and ecology of these species to enable restoration. And um, this is the case in both BC and in Alberta. And so, yeah, now I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we plan our restoration. So spatial restoration planning, like I said, we can't just be um, kind of ad hoc opportunistic. We have to be as strategic as possible. So this process was developed through the Crown Managers Partnership for the Crown of the Continent area. And this weird map um, is a grid of in Canada and in Alberta, where is the Crown of the Continent? And so on the right hand side, the green areas are protected areas in Alberta and the yellow ones are national parks in Alberta. And those orange squares are 12 by 12 kilometer grid cells that the landscape was divided into. And on the right hand side of this map now um, is scaled out the range of limber and whitebark pine in Alberta, basically all the mountains and foothills. And then in the lower right hand side, you should be able to see the crown of the continent grid where we did our initial strategic restoration planning. So we still have a lot of area that we have to extend this to. To develop this process, we did a one year pilot with white bark pine covering three areas in Montana. And then based on that successful process, we extended it over a two year process to include limber pine and over the full crown of the continent area, which as you can see, compared to Alberta and the rest of Canada's needs is pretty small. So that took us two years, but that was mostly starting out the process. And so um, just in the, lower area, those black outlines are the 12 by 12 kilometer grid squares. Each square has a label. And then the shading is habitat modeling or well, a logistic modeling for the likelihood of success of different restoration treatments. And the blue areas are uh, cut blocks. And the red stars are where we have mapped some plus trees. So we go through all these squares and then we develop our plans based on a series of, of decisions that I'll walk through in a minute. So um, this is based on genetic analysis and the biology of the species. We have established population viability thresholds. So in order to keep Clark's nutcrackers visiting these stands and dispersing the seeds that cannot disperse themselves, we need to have enough cone producing mature trees across the entire landscape to keep this system working. Once those populations decline to the point where birds aren't interested anymore because they can't get food, they will stop coming and the seeds will not be dispersed and those trees will not regenerate. So we need to think about this planning process for all of these 12 by 12 squares. And uh, yeah, we base this on the models of the likelihood of success for different restoration treatments like planting and thinning and other things like that. We also have to consider logistics and feasibility. Now, if Alberta is not going to, um, you know, currently approve using prescribed burns in certain areas, then that is not a tool that's available. So we have to consider what's available. Also in terms of access, these areas are very remote. It's very expensive to get everywhere with a helicopter. So we have to be pragmatic about our decisions for restoration. So our intent is to take this process and expand it 
to the Rockies and foothills and then across the rest of their species range. And it looks like partners have been very successful in securing funding to support this process. So looking forward to that. And the goal is to develop a 10 year spatial restoration plan for both of these species and to do it. And so uh, this is the article that outlines the steps for this restoration planning process. So the first step is we mapped out the actual range of the species where we had data and the potential range. So we might be restoring areas that are no longer occupied or areas that are suitable, but just happen to be not currently occupied due to various random factors. Oops. Um, and the next step is we also map out conservation values. So for example, watersheds, grizzly bear habitat, recreational values, other things like that. And then the next step is to map out the stressors across the range. For example, blister rust, mountain pine beetle, current and future fire risk. Some of these couldn't be mapped for Alberta because we just don't have this data. But we were able to adjust the model to incorporate all of the available data when we combined all the data from the partners across the crown of the continent. The next steps are, we develop a logic model for spatially explicit treatments. So what kind of stands and what characteristics and access and all that sort of thing would you plant at or thin or collect cones or apply other sorts of protective measures? So we modeled all that out. And then the model was used to generate core habitat areas for whitebark pine and limber pine. And those are polygons showing different uh, conservation values for the species. And then based on that, as well as trying to meet our population genetic targets within each 12 kilometer grid square, we're developing restoration action plan. And so this example is the Flathead National Forest. So uh, they were the first to complete their plan. We're a little jealous, but they only have 12 squares and we have hundreds. <laughs> so we're working towards this. So yeah, that's our area in the bottom. So I just wanted to uh, briefly talk a little bit more about plus trees. A plus tree is a healthy tree in a heavily infected stand. So for us, these are stands that have at least 80% blister rust infection. So over 80% of the trees are infected with rust. And unfortunately we have a lot of these. We have stands where 85, 90, over 95% of the trees have blister rust especially in the crown of the continent. The reason is if we plant seedlings from trees that are susceptible to blister rust, they're gonna die before they reproduce. So you're wasting all your time. We wanna make sure that the trees are unrelated that we, select plus, that we select for plus trees so we can maximize the diversity in the pool of trees that we're using for restoration. So like we were talking about before, those trees buried in a cache, if they're close together, they may be from the same parent tree or from related trees. So we wanted a sample over a broad area. We monitor these trees for um, cone production, of course, and health, because, you know, compared to all the other trees, when we select it, it might be healthy, but circumstances could change and it could be a really good year for fungal infection. And that tree that we thought was resistant, hey, maybe it gets blister rust in the field. Also, there's different kinds of resistance and some trees are only partially resistant. So it's important to track this over time. Then, like I said, we need to collect the tree, collect the seeds. Um, the way we do this is because the seeds are so delicious and every single bird and animal wants to eat them, we have to protect those seeds from being predated. So we have to climb to the top of every plus tree and we have to put a wire mesh cage over it so that the seeds don't get eaten. And then late in the fall when the seeds are ripe, then we climb back up the tree and collect them. We can't collect the seeds too early or the seeds won't grow into seedlings. They're too immature. There is no shortcut way to do this. We have tried a lot of different things. Also, we have to protect these trees from being attacked by beetle. Um, Parks Canada has an extensive program now where they're starting to fire smart all their trees, about two tree lengths um, around each tree. 
And we record um, after the trees get tested for genetic inheritance of blister rust. Then we record if the tree is a winner, that is it's passing on heritable disease resistance to its offspring, or it's not. And we just thought it was good in the field, but the seeds are not actually growing resist resistant seedlings. Then we wanna make sure that these locations of these trees are known so they can be protected if there's a development. So they're all in layer manager, the GOA GIS uh, layer warehouse. And yeah, we make this information available to project proponents, forestry companies, whoever's operating. These trees can't be replaced. They're super rare. We can't afford to lose them. So um, now I'll just briefly summarize what we do to test for disease resistance. Um, we do what's called backward selection. So the trees are, uh, we grow seedlings from each tree. We inoculate them to make sure that they're infected in a thorough but not overwhelming way. And then we monitor them for seven years. It takes seven years to assess if a tree is resistant and it costs $2,000 a tree. So we don't wanna waste our resources by looking at trees we're not fairly certain for. There's facilities in Oregon, BC and Idaho. And we also um, test them in the field as well as a double check. And we rely on a lot of partners for, for this process. Like I said, we protect from mountain pine beetle. We have our monitoring plots. I'm gonna talk about seed orchards and clone banks briefly in a second. We collect cyan, so cuttings to make copies of these trees. We provide training to build capacity. And we do as much outreach and education as we can. And we provide best practices. Seed orchard is like a fruit orchard. But the point of that is to try and make as many cones and seeds as possible, not fruit. So because we collect cyan from the top of every tree, it, contain, it carries the hormone balance from the top of a mature tree. So it should start producing cones and pollen many decades earlier than having to start from growing a seedling. We only use the best tested trees from each seed zone, and we establish many copies of each in a seed orchard in a secure and accessible site that we'll be using for about 50 years to create, uh, to try and grow as many seeds as possible. We fence them to protect them from vandalism and browsing. And um, yeah, sometimes they require irrigation for establishment. And a clone bank is a similar thing where it provides um, genetic copies of each parent tree, just in case something happens to the tree. And it's like a backup for the seed orchard. We need to make sure that we have multiple sites just in case something happens to our trees. And then here's just a map of where we have all our facilities. And also here's some photos of grafts in the nursery that are just a couple of years old that are already making pollen and cones. So this is a map of where all of our partners have done restoration planting so far, which is awesome. In Alberta, we've planted uh, close to 100, oops, close to 100 hectares so far, and over 30,000 seedlings planted. But so far across Canada, we've planted over 300,000 hectare, or excuse me, 300,000 seedlings in over 800 hectares, which isn't a lot, but it's growing rapidly over time. We rely a ton on partners to share information, knowledge, and resources across jurisdictions. We train each other to make sure the data is consistent. We share um, formal and informal knowledge with each other. We wanna make sure we're always using the most current science. We test the restoration methods for adaptive learning. And then we identify poly policies and try to overcome barriers where they arise. We know this is gonna take a super long time and we rely on champions. And I'm gonna give a big shout out to Joyce Gould, Office of the Chief Forester, super white bark pine champion. Thank you. So yeah, anyone working with species at risk knows you have to be optimistic to make this work. Basically, we're just gonna keep trying to build capacity, finish our 10 year implementation plan, keep applying for a million permits, <laughs> Keep applying for funding because this is super expensive. Keep planting tons of seedlings in the areas where they're most likely to succeed. Expand our seed orchards and clone banks and keep learning as we go.
we've learned a ton over the past 25 years of doing this. And um, yeah, I think we're, we're getting a lot better. And we just have to keep, keep doing it. So yeah, I just wanna say thanks to everyone. Here's some more information. And here's some of our supporters and partners. Really, honestly, there's no way we could do this without a ton of people's help. So thanks. Uh, thanks everyone for joining the science seminar today. Our next science seminar will be on December 6th and we will be hosting Dr. Vic Adamas, Adamowitz uh, from the University of Alberta who will be presenting on social and economic dimensions of chronic wasting disease in Alberta. Hope you all can join us for that. As a reminder, if you are not on our mailing list to receive invites for our science seminars and would like to be added to it, or your team has work that we'd like to share at an upcoming science seminar, please contact the Office of the Chief Scientists at aep.ocs at gov.ab.ca. We'll end there for today. Thanks again, Jody, for sharing your work and to everyone who tuned in, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.